Winnipeg Jets playoff edition. There we go. Show. I love it. Sarah Orleski here with Mitchell Clinton. Morning skate just wrapping up right now for the Winnipeg Jets. They got on the ice around 11 o'clock this morning, but knew it was going to be a fairly quick morning skate for them. As they finished things up here, done their stretch, had a little talk, and now they'll work on some of the finer things. See some guys working on face-offs as well, always important at this time. But meetings starting for the group in yeah. short order, so we know that things are going to be expedited a little bit going on here. Over this next little bit, we will take you inside the room. You'll hear live from players as they are speaking to the media. And then we are going to take a break, though, and then come back later on when Rick Bonus speaks, because he will be speaking after the media. That will be at approximately 12.15 Central Time. So let's talk a little bit about this series as we get yeah. set for game four tonight. Remember, this is a late local start, 8.30. So Mitch and I have already had, I don't know, two, three cups of coffee. There Several. You go. Several <laughs> this size. That's why we're doing it this morning and we're not doing yeah. this pregame show closer to puck drop because we might be a little bit jittery at that time. Yeah. This game is game four of the series right now, currently sitting at two games to one in favor of Vegas. Look, game one, obviously a Winnipeg Jets win. Game two, Vegas came back. They split the series in Vegas. And then obviously the thrilling comeback by yeah. the Jets with those three third period goals on Saturday afternoon, take it to two overtimes before ultimately coming up short. It's incredible how like different you feel, you know, like, I, I mean, I'm clearly not someone that's playing or anything like that, but you, you think if the Winnipeg Jets win that game three, like, I, I, number one, I can't imagine what the ovation would have been like in this building and on the street because shout out to all the fans that were involved in that. That was entirely worth the wait since 2019. Uh, for that whiteout and and yet so you lose it happens uh, but you think about you know you're still only down 2-1 yep. you know you're still on home ice for game four yes there's going to be some adversity tonight we'll get into that in a little bit but at the same time you got a chance to tie this series up and head back to Vegas and it's a best of three and I think that's probably probably the perspective the Winnipeg Jets have to take is yeah it was a real difficult way to lose a game certainly but Look, we got an opportunity to even things up and be 2-2 into a best of three the rest of the way. You mentioned adversity. Let's get right into that. Obviously, the news announced immediately after game three that Josh Morrissey's lost for the remainder of the season yeah. or series, sorry, series with a lower body, uh, with a lower body injury for mm -hmm. it. That obviously is a massive hole for the Jets. They yeah. are already without Nikolai Ehlers. He just you know, it's uncertain when he's going to be able to return yeah. to the lineup, but to lose your number one defenseman is a big hole. This is going to take more than just your blue liners to be yeah. able to help fill this. Yeah, it's it's going to be by committee, of course, and based on the morning skate. Now, the one thing that we should say is yesterday, Rick Bonus did not rule out the possibility of seven defensemen. I mean, everybody at this point is playing with some sort of bumps and bruises or possibly worse than that. Uh, but based on the line rushes that we saw a little bit earlier, it looks like it will be Logan Stanley drawing in. Uh, but it is going to be, as you see Logan there, it is going to be by committee. It's going to be absolutely everybody who is Nate Schmidt paired with Dylan DeMello as well, kind of filling out the rest of the, the six defensemen that we do expect to, to play tonight. But like you said, it's going to be by committee, and the forwards have a lot to do with that as well. You know, Of course they're going to be in position in their own end. Your center is going to be low, helping out on the pucks and all that kind of stuff. But I feel like as a collective, it becomes more of a, like, look, we got to take care of our own end. And usually if we take care of our own end, things up the ice tend to work out a little bit better in our favor too. So, yeah, you know, you lose Josh Morrissey. There's absolutely no replacing him, and the Jets aren't hiding from that fact. But you do have to take it as a challenge for your group to be able to come out and prove that, you know what, just because we don't have Josh Morrissey, it doesn't mean that we're just done here. We're, we've got a lot to play for. So you think about idea that it may be 6D that is going with and if yeah. it looks like Logan Stanley might be the one in that respect to get the nod. What is it about Logan's skill set that you think even the edge may be over a Kyle Capabianco or how he yeah. can help this team? Well it's been re relatively close throughout the regular season in terms of appearances. Kyle Capabianco at 14, Logan Stanley 19 and the one thing that I do know of course that Logan Stanley does have out over Kyle Capobianco is playoff experience. He's got eight games played in 2021, played every, all four games against the Edmonton Oilers, of course has gone to overtime, we remember that series quite well, and of course he played and scored twice against Montreal in game four uh, in the Stanley Cup playoffs there in that second round that obviously doesn't, doesn't go the Winnipeg Jets way. 
you look back over the course of the season, Kyle Capobianco certainly did seem to have a little bit more of an offensive side to his game than Logan Stanley does, but Logan Stanley is a guy that could step in on your penalty kill where, you know, obviously your defensemen, there were a couple of times in game three where the Jets were down to literally, I think, three guys. Because mm -hmm. Morrissey was out, you had uh, Dylan DeMello and Brendan Dillon in the penalty box at the same time. So when you're down, if you get yourself into that situation, having a guy like Logan Stanley that can also kill penalties and not force someone like Neil Pionk to stay out for an entire penalty kill like he pretty much had to do in Game 3, kind of leans into uh, perhaps Logan Stanley get, getting the uh, the edge tonight. But uh, we'll see. I guess warm-up will be the confirmation. But as of the, the morning skate right now, it certainly looks like Logan Stanley's getting that nod. Let's take a look a bit at the lines up front and talk about it yeah. as we wait for the room to open up and for players to begin speaking with the media. We saw Rick Bonus adjust his lines in yeah. the last game, try to generate. They didn't have anything going through the first really two periods yeah. for it. He was able to get something going, obviously, when he adjusted the lines. There had been so much talk about the decision that he had made when he moved Mark Shifley onto yeah. that line with Pierre-Luc Dubois playing on the wing. Well, he moved Shifley back to center, saying essentially yesterday they had run the course and gotten pretty much yeah. as much as they could out of that line. Shifley needed to go back to the middle. Yeah, and it immediately paid off, really, for the Winnipeg Jets. Yes, Mark Shifley's goal in the third period in Game 3 comes on the power play, but, you know, I just felt it was a kind of a recipe that was building throughout the entire third period. The Winnipeg Jets really got back to... What makes them real good? They just controlled their own end and then they were able to get into the offensive zone with a little bit more speed and create some opportunities off of it. Mark Shifley, of course, is a is a natural center. He's played that his entire career. You know, went on the wing to try to help and make things happen for the Winnipeg Jets down the stretch and it really looked like it was something that was working for them in the first couple of games against Vegas here. But, you know, that's the playoffs. you got to make adjustments. And I thought, you know, you put Vladislav Nemestikov on the left wing with Mark Shifley. Those are two guys with... A lot of hockey IQ between the two of them. They seem to play off each other quite well. Blake Wheeler, of course, we know what he's capable of. Uh, and certainly that gives you Kyle Connor with Pierre-Luc Dubois, a combo that's worked out pretty much every time that's been put on the ice. And I thought Nito Niederreiter with his size was a really big add to that line as well. So some options still for, for Rick Bonus, but you got to make those adjustments when they feel right. And when you made those adjustments in game three, it really paid off. Especially going into a game like this, so much attention is going to be paid to those top six and, yep. and the production. They need their best to be at their best and to produce because we have been seeing that from Vegas as mm -hmm. they've gotten going with Jack Eichel and the way that Mark Stone's going and so on and so forth. They don't have necessarily when you look at their regular season numbers they didn't have a player hit the 30 goal arc, yeah. but they did have a lot of depth and a lot of contributions throughout the lineup it looks like rick bonus will be making another change and that would be on the fourth line yeah actually Johnson fialbi taking the uh, the line rushes looks like he could draw in a, another guy that's a penalty killer but a guy that brings a lot of speed that's always the first thing that comes to my mind when i think of actually Johnson fialbi and also a guy that could, that could put the puck in the net we've seen it a little bit uh, throughout the regular season he's got a really good shot and he's not afraid to get in on the forecheck, which is an ultimately uh, a, a big thing that the Jets need to be able to establish in the early going. Of course, they're going to feed off the crowd, but they got to channel it the right way. So I think Janssen Fialbi, what he brings is a little bit more pace to that fourth line with Kevin Stenland and Sacramento Linen. And, and those three have worked together very well throughout the year, whether it was, you know, on the penalty kill, they worked together. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of games where you've seen that trio work together. So I'm looking forward to seeing how Axel Janssen Fialbi plays in his debut in this series and what he can bring. Yeah, in, in place, here's for David Gustafson. Now, the Jets have also made an emergency recall. Now, don't worry, Connor Hellebuck went yes. through. You tweeted out as we look for every game day. Mitchell's um, tweet saying that Connor Hellebuck is going through his starting routine. routine. Yeah, on the ice, but um, they have made an emergency recall. Yeah, David Riddick not on the ice for uh, for morning skate. Now it was it was almost odd in terms of seeing. Now they they already have Oscar Salmon in from the Manitoba Moose up, uh, and he's been you know practicing with Wade Flaherty, the goaltending coach. And then it just kind of I saw another goaltender coming on the ice, and I just thought, okay, well there's there's David Riddick. Got back to what I was doing, but it wasn't David Riddick. It was Arvid Holm, like you said, emergency recall. So probably going to get some clarification, yeah. I would imagine, uh, after the morning skate on that. So stay tuned, but. Uh, an interesting wrinkle, nonetheless, in a morning skate full of them. Yeah, absolutely. It's mentioned Rick Bonus expected to go at approximately 12.15 today. The Jets, after their availability, will have a power play meeting, their penalty meeting. So 
They've got some meetings to go beforehand, which is why after the availability, we will wrap for a bit before, of course, as always, bringing you head coach Rick Bonus live. So the Jets, after game three, you go into the double overtime, the disappointment of it, the, I mean, you look at the D playing almost that entire game with just 5D, the exhaustion. There was a lot of talk yesterday about, I don't know, mustard packs or maple syrup that guys were ingesting, trying to get a little bit of sugar into them as they uh, kept going. What do you think is the key to being able to bounce back after something like that and not letting the disappointment of the loss and the loss of Josh Morrissey carry over and instead build on that third period and the momentum that they had going in. I think what's going to be interesting, and of course we can't talk about the double overtime without talking about Dylan Sandberg, right? So a guy that played really a spectacular uh, game and has played quite well during the series in in a role that, you know, obviously you lose Josh Morrissey, you're down to 5D, you're playing an elevated role, uh, was Dylan Sandberg. And you know what? What I what I liked out of yesterday was the fact that you had Nate Schmidt come out, you had uh, Neil Pion come out with Dylan Sandberg, and they all talk about the support for him. And I really do think, and I wrote this on WinnipegJets.com yesterday, this can be something that the group can rally around. Because Dylan Sandberg has shown time and time again throughout the regular season that, yes, mistakes happen, but he tends to bounce back from those. And, you know, you're down Josh Morrissey. you got a guy in Dylan Sandberg who's, you know, wearing it a little bit. But he's also got two NCAA titles to his name. He's used to big games. He can come back and bounce back from that. And so as a group, I think that becomes the thing that you, that you rally around coming into game four. You know, it's just, you know, like, look, maybe there's some people counting us out. Maybe. But we're not counting ourselves out. We know what we're capable of defensively. We've battled injuries all year. So I think that's going to be something that they all kind of rally around and bring their best for game four. All right. Let's head into the room right now. We're going to hear from Mark Shifley. Back to middle point. Uh, you know, I thought we, we, we created a lot, especially in game two. You know, we were kind of, uh, you know, I feel like a little snake bit, and we had a lot of chances, especially early in that game. And, um, you know, sometimes you just need to change. You know, you know it's up to, that's up to the coaches. And, um, you know, like I said before, it's just, you know, wherever they want me, I'll be ready to go. And, um, you know, it's playoffs. You know, you just got to be, you got to be on your toes. You got to be ready for anything. And um, that's all you can do. Were you starting to really feel it with Vlad and, uh, and Blake in the third period of game three? Yeah, I started to feel, started to feel good in that third period. Uh, you know, just, it, it, it's different. You know, you when you go from wing, from center to wing, uh, a lot of different touches, a lot of different areas that you're in that, uh, you know, you might not be used to. But, um, you know, just got to, you know, start it off again tonight and come out strong. Have you scored a lot in your career? I mean, what does it mean to get the first one in this series? And is there a... Not to say a weight is lifted, but is there a little bit of an you know, exhale? Yeah, obviously it's always nice to score. Um, you know, obviously that third period our team was our team was going. We were getting a lot of chances. We were uh, creating a lot, so that that was that was that was that was uh, you know exciting getting the fans into it. Um, you know, obviously a, a great comeback, and um, you know we got to leave that one behind us and, and be ready for this game. You know, we know, we know it's going to be another tough test, and um, you know we we know they're going to come out strong, and and we got to do the same. Uh, Mark, how much more premium is there on gap and all these other details now that you're going to be missing your best defenseman for the balance of the series? Yeah, of course. You know, you lose you lose a guy like Josh. You know, a you know a Norris Trophy candidate. You know, it's gonna it's gonna hit your team hard. But um, you know, we got a lot of character guys in this room. We have a lot of guys that um, you know that are going to step up. And it, it, it's not just one guy. It's not just two guys. It's the whole team got to step up for a for a loss like that. And and we all got to be ready to go tonight. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, that definitely was, uh, you know, a, a great comeback to that point. Um, you know, we easily could have kind of folded, uh, folded the tent and, you know, concede the game. But you know, we we got great will in here and great leadership, and um, yeah, you know, we have a an attitude that you know we're never going to give up. So, you know, we, we did a good job, I think, there of uh, you know playing on our toes, being aggressive, playing fast. First two periods a little slow for us. Um, in regards to moving the puck, obviously you guys were moving and, and hitting and um, you know playing hard, but uh, you know we, we didn't play maybe as smart as we should have in the first two periods. And uh, Vegas made us uh, you know penalize us for our mistakes. And 
We did a good job in the third period of, uh, of, of playing fast, shooting pucks, and, and getting on the forecheck. And, you know, we're going to need that tonight. Barring overtime and, you know, barring potential injury, you guys shouldn't have to carry this heavy workload as last game. But what do you take from that experience that showing yourselves that in a game like that that you need and you guys were able to walk heavy minutes and still really bring it? Yeah, very rarely you're going to complain about too many minutes as, as a player. Um, but it was, uh, you know what, it was a lot of fun. Even even though we, we didn't get the results to, you know, the fans were fantastic at the, at the beginning of the game there for me. That's something I always remember. That was gave me absolute goosebumps with with our with our fans, and we're gonna we're gonna have that noise tonight. It's gonna be a lot of fun, and, and even the comeback, although it, it came short, that was a fantastic comeback from the group, resilient, um, and it was just a lot of fun to play in those games. It's what you dream of, of playing in games, overtime, double overtime games, and even though we didn't get results, you know, as a competitor, it was a fantastic hockey game, and um, we left it all out there. We just uh, we just couldn't find that that final goal. Yeah, it's it's no doubt it's a, it's a huge loss. Josh can do things that only Josh does out there. Um, so it may look a little different. Doesn't mean we can't get the job done back here. And we got a lot of faith in, in our group in the back end. It'll be by committee for sure. We'll need everybody to step up and carry the load. But uh, you know, we, we've won games without Josh this year, and obviously it'll be a big test against a fantastic Vegas team. But um, I think guys are really ready for the challenge and the opportunity, and and uh, you know, hopefully we can get it done tonight. What are some of the words of encouragement that he said to you guys individually, and collectively, as a defensive I'll just play our game. Um, you know, there will be times where we, uh, you know, we need to definitely we'll need a little bit more from everybody in regards to offense. But um, you know, it starts with us playing good D, playing solid, not giving them much, taking away uh, time and space, breaking out the puck, giving it to our forwards, and let them go to work. And and when the time presents itself, to to join and, and uh, try to create some offense. Yeah, Dylan DeMello with the second most ice time out of any blue liners for the Jets last game. 36 minutes, 31 seconds, one assist, six hits, four blocks. <laughs> Leading the way was Neil Pionk. 41 minutes and change. Special teams and his role, both power play and Oh, shorthanded, playing a big role with that over six minutes yeah. with special teams. Yeah, and, and, you know, obviously picking up three assists in that third period as well. He's a big part of that comeback, and that's someone that I've kind of got my eye on tonight. Yep. Is You know, he's going to be playing with his uh, regular defensive pair uh, partner in, in Brendan Dillon, but, you know, Neil Pionk's a guy that, you know, has shown that he's he's capable of producing at, at both ends of the ice and, and, and being a real big part for the Winnipeg Jets. Wouldn't say yesterday if he's not still playing through some kind of injury, but at the same time, you know, like we said, everybody's playing with something at this time of year, but Neil Pionk really stepped up when the Winnipeg Jets needed him, and that's going to continue tonight. You mentioned earlier when we were first discussing Game 3 and the results that you couldn't discuss it without mentioning what happened to yeah. with Dylan Sandberg and what led to the overtime goal for it. He spoke to the media yesterday. His body language, you just, I felt it was impossible to watch him and yeah. just have your heart feel for him a yeah. little bit because you could see that he was still wearing it emotionally. Mm. But the way that his defensive partners, teammates rallied around him, whether it be Nate Schmidt, who spoke to the media, Neil Pionk as well, Herman yeah. Town brother yes, exactly. uh, up there with him, just rallying around him for it. But how key is that going to be? Again, when we talk about yeah. this group trying to bounce back, it's going to be important that Dylan Sandberg has that short memory. Well, and they always say, you know, can't get too high, can't get too low. But that's why they also always say, well, that's easier said than done. You know, you go through something like that if you're Sandberg and, you know, your, your whole team, especially your, your defensive group, has put together that kind of effort over the course of a game and it all comes down to one bounce. Like that's the the cruel part of the Stanley Cup playoffs. And, you know, you think back, you know, the Jets in the first overtime period hit the post, you know, like it, it all comes down to a couple of inches, right? So, but you, like you said, it's going to be important because, you know, if, if Sandberg's playing with uh, with Logan Stanley tonight, you know, that's going to be a unit that's going to be counted on. They're not going to be able to, yeah, the Jets have last change, but, you know, the game still happens. Icings happen. Things happen. You're going to end up with some tough matchups. And it's, all, it's going to be all about how they respond. Logan Stanley hasn't played in a little bit. Yep. Dylan Sandberg has. He's, he's been part of the, the, the stretch run. Logan Stanley, like we mentioned, has playoff experience. They're going to face those those matchups, and they're going to need to perform well, and that's why you need to have a short memory. Well, someone will be waiting to see whether or not he makes his playoff debut. Kyle Capobianco is speaking with the media. I mean, I uh, watched the last game from up top, and the energy was awesome, so it's exciting. Sure. 
yeah, I mean, it's better to be uh, over-prepared than under-prepared. And, I mean, I'll, I'll get my nap, my pre-game meal, and we'll see what happens. Yeah, obviously he's a huge part of our team. Uh, I think, yeah, just each one of us try to step our game up a little bit and try to hopefully fill his shoes a bit. Yeah, like I said before, just bring energy, some, bring some skating, and bring some life to the team. <laughs> if you've ever wondered what it's like in a, in a dressing room for media availabilities, that's it. If it you'd is... like to know more specifically what it's like for a cameraman yes. in an availability, especially yes. a playoff of availability, that would be it, as everybody is trying to get around the players in order to be able to get a good vantage point yes. for it. It's certainly not easy, but we appreciate the work of the guys inside the room right now. We're just looking. I'm looking out over there. The black aces, sometimes like to refer to them, yes. on the on the ice right now and we look it's still about 20 minutes before vegas takes the ice for their morning skate they're scheduled to take the ice oh, there's the live shot so not many of them left right now for it they're out there but often using that final ice time to be able to try to get in a little bit of extra work vegas will take to the ice at noon here and then have their availability after as mentioned it is an 8 30 start tonight now speaking to kyle capabianco in there and listening to him you look at his season stats so far, and we were discussing what his numbers were like and his experience as well. Ice time for it will be interesting to see, regardless of whether or not we see Stanley, Capobianco, or both in the lineup this evening, what sort of ice time these two could be expected to shoulder. Yeah, exactly, and you never know if overtime might have something to do with that. And then I think also Scott O'Neill tends to run the, the defenseman, and you know Rick Bonus had a, a lot of compliments for the work that he did over the course of that. Uh, stretch uh, in game three working with five defensemen and it is going to be interesting because you see on their average ice time it's really I mean it's a minute here or there it's it's not really much of a, a difference so they're used to the role that they're likely going to be stepping into play now of course Stanley Cup playoffs everything's faster decisions got to be made quicker every move is magnified right but at the same time these are guys that they're pro athletes they, they know what to expect and if it does come down to 7d obviously that's going to change some things in terms of rotation and how they yeah. all work together but you know you have to be able to figure out the best way and the best way to deploy your personnel for tonight and if, and if that's 11 forwards and, and seven defense work bonus will go with that they didn't use it a whole lot during the regular season but you have to do what you have to do come playoff time as we get ready to wrap up here availability has ended inside the room players have gone into their meetings as well for it, just when you look at this game here tonight, obviously we've seen the Jets be able to bounce back from adversity the way that they did in game three. That is never a situation that you want to put yeah. yourself in, though. In your mind, to be able to take advantage of what Vegas gives them, maybe force Vegas to give them some yeah. stuff, what is it that you'll be watching for? And you think people yeah. at home should be watching for as well. It all starts in the defensive end. You look back to game one and the third period of game three. Now, contextually a little bit different because game three, you know, obviously Vegas had the lead, so maybe they sit back a little bit. But you look at game one, what did the Winnipeg Jets do really well? Well, they broke the puck out very efficiently. They made the easy play, made the simple play, allowed them to get the neutral zone with some speed. They won some puck battles, especially in the offensive zone. So it all comes down to little details. But the way that I always see the Winnipeg Jets, when they're playing their best, in the defensive zone, everything is pretty much clinical. You're not allowing Vegas to establish that forecheck and allowing you know, some of their bigger forwards to get in on, on your defensemen and make things more difficult. If you're able to break the puck out efficiently, you're hitting that neutral zone with a little bit more speed. That forces Vegas to have to back off uh, at the line. Those zone entries get a little bit easier. Now you can go to work in the offensive zone with that forecheck that gave the Winnipeg Jets so much success. So that's why they say it's a 200-foot game, but it all starts in the defensive zone for the Winnipeg Jets. You mentioned when we first began the whiteout, the atmosphere in here that Jets fans, as to be expected, yeah. completely brought it for Game 3. The atmosphere was electric. Or fans, or not just fans, players loved it. Yeah. Fed off it as well for it. It was an experience that so many of them hadn't had the opportunity to have mm. before here, and they loved it. So looking for more of that in Game 4 as well, whether it be out in the street party that's going on. I always love those visuals yes. out there, the energy out there, electric, or inside here as well. Reminder that game tonight is a late one, so... 
Mitchell and I are going to get our fifth cup of coffee all ready <laughs> for I'll this. I'll get this round. They're fine. You got the fine. first you four, insist. I'll That's get this right. one. I appreciate get it. Teamwork. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is it for us for this pregame show. Don't forget to set your notifications because we're going to be back around 12.15 when Coach heads to the podium so that hopefully he will have an update regarding potentially the lineup. I mean, I don't expect him to tell us what he's doing because he hasn't yet, but yeah. you never know. And maybe an update as well as to where things stand with David Riddick. Mm -hmm. Some questions that are looking to be answered as well. But as always, make sure that you tune in for that. But WinnipegJets.com for the previews, that and more. We will have it fully covered for you as the day goes on, as the game gets going, and of course, post game as well. All right, that is it for us. Thanks so much for joining. He has to go get me coffee. Yes. And that's a wrap. See you later on.